Let's remain standing as Jolene comes to read to us this morning from God's word. Reading from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. The song goes, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. But now I see, and as you can well imagine, we'll be singing those words just a little bit later in the service, because I think when the sermon itself is entitled Amazing Grace, it's not really very hard to predict exactly which song the hymn of response will be. What is hard, and I can tell you this from experience now this past week, is choosing among the hundreds of other songs about grace and the host of various newer versions of Amazing Grace too. when you said about planning the service. Because everybody loves the idea of grace. We love to think about grace, we love to talk about grace, to study it, and to sing about it. I grew up singing grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. And of course we sing about it, of course we praise God for it. The Greek word charis, which is translated as grace in the New Testament, is used about 775 times in the New Testament books. And about 625 of those times in that short 27 book, uh, books of the New Testament, it's translated simply grace. It would be at least arguable and I think probable that one of the most quoted and most preached on texts of the New Testament would be Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 where we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing as a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. And how many times have we heard someone say, There, but for the grace of God go I, and how many times... Have we quoted or heard someone else quote that portion of Romans chapter 6 verse 10 that says, we are not under law, but under grace. Especially if there's been some conversation about some behavior in our lives or in our world that seems to go against the law of God. And we go back and we look at the Old Testament and we say, well, this is what God said about this. This is the word of the Lord. And somebody will say, yeah, but that's Deuteronomy. We're not under law, we're under grace. Someone will say, inevitably, Jesus never said a word about, well, many things, particularly these days about homosexuality. And the fact of the matter is he did. But the other fact of the matter is he didn't have to because it's all God's word from Genesis to Revelation. God speaks there. There are many things that Jesus did not address specifically in the words of his that we have recorded for us in the Gospels that we would all say, well, well, of course that's wrong. Abusing children is wrong. These days, abusing pets is wrong. And we would say that even though Jesus didn't specifically say it because we find in the arc of Scripture this teaching that there are certain ways that we are meant to behave as people who want to live for the glory of God and to honor his holiness and his, the work of his spirit in our lives. And so we say that we are not under law but under grace. Frankly, there's more to that verse, and we'll come back to it in a little bit. But the point is we just want to focus on grace. Grace. 
We want to be a people whose lives are characterized by grace. We want to be a church that is known for the proclamation of God's grace. We want to be a community that is filled to overflowing with the marvelous, infinite, matchless, amazing grace of God. And that's a good thing. Because this is how we are made right with God. Out of God's free, out of God's free, immeasurable, uncommon grace, out of sheer grace, as the Heidelberg Catechism frames it, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. As if I had never sinned or been a sinner, as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. And I hope for everyone here and everyone listening this morning that you all have that sense that out of the sheer mercy and grace of God, all of our sins are completely forgiven. And God now looks at us as if we had never sinned or been sinners. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the grace by which we have been saved, and this ought to be the testimony of every true follower of Jesus Christ, our faithful Savior. By grace, I am redeemed, and only by grace. And by grace and grace alone, I am restored. But consider as well our text this morning from Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation For all people. Now, there are some who would construe this as a universalist passage, a passage that teaches that all people everywhere, regardless of faith, regardless of life, regardless of anything, will somehow be saved by the grace of God. After all, it does say the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. And I wish that this would go without saying, but here's the thing to make this text teach universal salvation, you have to make this passage contradict itself, never mind all of the other texts in Paul's writings and in all of scripture that teach exactly the opposite. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 1 verses 6 through 10, God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to those of you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints. Sometimes people hear that and they think, oh, I wish we just didn't talk about that but it's clear from scripture that a day is coming a day that God has appointed to judge the entire earth through the man that he validated for that position by raising him from the dead Jesus Christ our Lord and Jesus himself spoke of this in Matthew 25 and many other places then he The Son of Man will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. When Paul writes in Titus, The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. It's with that in the background. It is not a universalist text. That is not what it means. Consider these together with Titus 2 verse 14, which tells us that Jesus Christ gave himself both to redeem us from all lawlessness. By the way, that's just sin. Sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is sin. Christ came to redeem us from that and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And since Paul was not writing with a split personality and Paul does not contradict himself within the space of a single paragraph and because we believe that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. I can talk about Paul being the author of this letter but ultimately it did not come from Paul but holy men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And when we understand that that is the source of God's word, it should be evident that there can be no final conflict here. No contradiction between any two passages or more of scripture. 
besides verse 11 to 15 follows after verses 1 through 10, where Paul instructed his protege, his mentee, Titus, to teach what accords with sound doctrine. And to teach what accords with sound doctrine to older men and older women, to young women, to younger men, and to bond servants. And when we understand that whole progression through the first part of the chapter, it's evident Paul is not saying that the grace of God has brought salvation to every human being who has ever lived or ever will live, but rather that it has brought salvation to all kinds of people. It has brought salvation to the old and the young, to men and to women, to bond servants and masters, to people who have different levels of melanin in their skin, because there is only one race, so we need to stop it with that people of different races thing. The grace of God that appears, has appeared bringing salvation across the board to all kinds of people, to every tribe and tongue and nation. And then when we factor in the conjunction at the beginning of verse 11, it becomes obvious that Titus is to teach what accords with sound doctrine to the whole of the church without distinction for, as one commentator has stated, this is the very aim and business of Christianity to instruct and help and form persons under all distinctions and all relations to a right frame and conduct. But someone will say... I thought this was about grace. How do we come to be talking about forming persons to a right frame and conduct? On Reformation Day, aren't we supposed to be talking about grace alone? And after all, are we not under law but under grace? Well, right. But the full quote from Romans chapter 6 begins with just that question. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law? but under grace. Paul never makes the point, never, not in Romans, not anywhere else in scripture is the point made that because we are under grace and not law, we can just disregard the law and push it off to the side and do whatever we want and do whatever feels good. That is not Paul's point. Yes, we are not under law, we are under grace, but does that mean that we can just sin willy-nilly and willfully whenever and however we want? Paul's answer, by no means. And the verse just preceding this, he said, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. So far from teaching a cheap grace which amounts to the justification of sin without the justification of the repentant sinner who departs from sin and from whom sin departs, as one author has described it. The thought that we are not under law but under grace is not intended to motivate us to like a moral laxity where we just feel like, yeah, we can just live, live our best lives and God will bless it now and if there's anything wrong with it, he'll forgive us and he'll receive us to himself in the end. That idea that we are not under law but under grace is intended to motivate us to present ourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and our members, all the various parts of our body as instruments to God or to God as instruments for righteousness. This is also evident from the first words of Titus 2 verse 12. Having been told that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, we are then told what grace does. Here it is, Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us, teaching us. The word is sometimes even translated disciple. See, grace is not the mere declaration that one thing has become another thing. Grace is the power of God that transforms us from the former to the latter. And grace trains us. It teaches us. And what does this amazing, uncommon grace of God teach? Again, verse 12. It teaches us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Some have argued that because we're under grace, we don't need to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, but it's grace itself that teaches us that we need to do that. 
and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So a negative instruction, a no, if you will, and followed by a positive. First, grace trains us. Grace teaches us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. If we wanted to just say that in a word, that word would be repentance. Grace brings us to Christ Jesus by way of repentance. Grace causes us to see those things in our lives which are dishonoring and displeasing to God and to turn away from those things, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. Grace teaches us to turn away from the deeds of the flesh and the vain pursuits of this world. And then on the positive side, and this is really just the rest of repentance, because it doesn't make any sense to turn away from something if you are not turning towards something. On the positive side, grace teaches us to be sanctified in the truth. Let me borrow Paul's words to the Colossians. God's grace teaches us this. It teaches us to put to death, therefore, whatever is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry, among a host of other things. Put those things to death. Renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. And then put on, as God's chosen ones, Holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Grace teaches us to renounce, even to abhor, what is evil, and to embrace and to live out the will of God for our lives as that will is revealed in Holy Scripture. And grace teaches us to do this in the here and the now. We are meant to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Grace is not some power that allows us to live how we want now because someday... God's going to take us to himself and then everything's going to be all better. Grace teaches us to live this way in this present age. In the words of the old Puritan Matthew Henry, thus the gospel first unteaches, my spell checker loved that word, it unteaches that which is evil, to abandon sin. And then the gospel teaches us to live well here in this world, not, however, as our final state, but with an eye chiefly to a future For it teaches us in all to look for the glories of another world to which a sober, righteous, and godly life in this world is preparative. See, grace is not a doctrine to be held and admired in the abstract, to be stored in a theological closet, and then strolled out for an hour on Sunday mornings. Grace is not a change in God's attitude towards sinners that leaves the sinners unchanged and capable of the same behavior. Grace is the transformative power of God that is unleashed by the sovereign spirit of God right here in the nitty-gritty of our day-to-day living. The Lord Jesus Christ did not pay for our sin on the cross so that he could abandon us in our sin and then just forgive us at the end of time. As we read In verse 14, Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. That's parallel to that other text that I read earlier in the service, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 this time. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For... We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, we are not only saved from something. Hallelujah, we are saved from something. We are saved from our sin and from the consequences of our sin. But we are also saved to something. We are saved that we may no longer live for ourselves but may live for him who for our sake died and was raised. 
and the former, that idea that we are saved from something, is not grace at all. If the latter, that we are saved to something, is considered optional. If salvation, as if salvation was this mighty work of God by which he just declares us righteous in his sight, and then, you know, sanctification, well, that would be a good thing. Kind of a luxury accessory that we can choose depending on whether or not we want to pay the extra cost. But salvation includes sanctification. Sanctification is a part of salvation and both are first and last and always the work of God. That's what we're singing about when we sing Amazing Grace. I once was lost, now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. This is what we mean when we sing of a grace that is greater than all our sin. And I think we need to be reminded of this again, because even in some of our current struggles, some of the discussions that we had at our classes meeting a couple of days ago, the struggle that exists around human sexuality, there's this tendency to retreat to the idea of that, that grace is something that justifies the sin and not the repentant sinner. Cheap grace that comforts us in our sin rather than freeing us from our sin. Imagine, if you can, Jesus finding a leper along the side of the road. That sort of thing happened from time to time in the Gospels. And as Jesus approaches that leper, the man in all of his uncleanness and disease looks up with a certain amount of hope Because here comes Jesus, and he's thinking, maybe today is the day when my exile is over and I get to go home to my family and friends. But instead of hearing those hoped-for words, I am willing, be thou made clean, Jesus, as he draws near, just pulls out of a sack a lovely, warm, quilted comforter, and he wraps it around the leper. And he says, I hope that makes things a little bit better. I hope that makes your world a little bit softer, a little bit easier. I hope that's very hard to imagine because no such thing ever happened in the Gospels. Such comfort would be sorry comfort indeed. It would not be worth being our only comfort in life and in death. And in Luke chapter 5, when a man full of leprosy, who was just waiting for Jesus to come his way, fell on his face and begged him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus didn't just say, well, God bless you. Step back. We need some social distancing here. When the man said that, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And this is grace that is greater, grace which does not leave us in our sin, grace which doesn't come to us as a nice worn comforter to wrap us up while we continue to be that broken, sin-sick person on the inside, but grace that sets us free. This is the wonderful, infinite, matchless, amazing grace of God to us in his son, Christ Jesus, our Lord. That grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly desire and to live soberly, self-controlled lives in this world looking for the blessed hope, even the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the amazing grace of God. Grace that transforms dead people into living people, sick people into healthy people. Grace that transforms sinners into saints and empowers them to live lives that are pleasing to the Lord our God. I'm going to ask that you stand with me here at the end of the message and confess this with me this morning. Please stand. Congregation of Jesus Christ, how are you right with God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ 
even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments and of never having kept any of them, and even though I am still inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without my deserving it at all, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. As if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me, all I need to do is accept this gift with a believing heart. I hope you can recall those words. You can always look them up at the back of the hymnal or in any copy of the Heidelberg Catechism. Because those are precious, precious words. Without our deserving it at all. There's nothing in us that would appeal to God in some sense and make him love us and show his grace, us his grace. Without our deserving it at all, God grants and credits out of sheer grace the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. If you have come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, this is how God sees you. Doesn't matter. What you have done, as long as you come to him, trusting in him alone, trusting in his grace, confessing your sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Indeed, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Let's sing together. <laughs>